Hello everybody, this is Homer White, back again with an introduction to the data analysis report for chapter three of our course. This is the first of a two-part video series. In this video, we're simply going to examine the structure of a data analysis report. It's the same as the usual structure, but we're now applying it to a situation where, exam where we are examining the relationship between two factor variables. We're going to include some inferential results along with the descriptive results that you're familiar with from previous chapters. So let's get down to it. First of all, you want to get the example data report up. So you go to the Math 111 common source folder. Look for the instructor that you're interested in. Let's say it's Dr. White. Go into the folder that you know contains your data analysis report assignments for your particular class or year. And then find the data analysis report example for Chapter 3. Notice that it is present in several forms. The source document or markdown also knitted up into PDF or Word. What we'll do in this video is take a look at the PDF version of the example. So we open it up. and it'll show up in a separate pane of our web browser. If you'd like to see thumbnail sketches or a table of contents, then consider toggling this bar. My first assignment to you is to pause this video, open a copy of the document for yourself, and read it through once. Come back when you're done. All right, hello. Suppose you've read through the report Let's go through it a bit. All data analysis reports have an introduction, a methods section, a results section, which may be subdivided between descriptive results and, if we have them, inferential results, and then a discussion and conclusion. Remember that the introduction simply introduces the reader to the data set that you plan to analyze and to the research question that is particular to your project. The method section is where you perform your variable analysis in order to decide what descriptive and inferential methods are appropriate to studying your research question. In this case, the UC Davis data frame contained two variables that pertain to the research question, do liberal arts and non-liberal arts students at UC Davis differ in their seating preferences? The two variables were, first of all, class, that is the type of student, whether the student was liberal arts or non-liberal arts. And the second variable was seat. This was a factor variable with three values, back, front, and middle. This is something that the author of this report must have discovered by looking at the data frame itself. If the data frame were available in a package in R, the person might have discovered these things by doing help on the name of the data frame. The person begins the variable analysis by identifying the two variables and deciding what type of variable each one is. Class is clearly a factor variable. Seat is also a factor variable. So we know that we are going to be analyzing the relationship between two factor variables. It's also a good idea at this stage to decide which of the, which of the two variables you would like to think of as the explanatory variable in this case, we decided to think of seat as the explanatory variable and class as the response. Not because we believe that where you sit causes or explains the type of major you choose, but we're imagining that we might like to use where someone sits to predict which type of student they are, a liberal arts or non-liberal arts student. Having done the variable analysis, we can decide what methods are appropriate we know that when we're looking at the relationship between two factor variables, then graphical descriptive statistics can be accomplished with bar charts, 
numerical descriptive statistics can be accomplished with two-way tables in row percentages. But remember also that in this chapter, we've learned some inferential methods for examining our research question. We're able to address the question of whether any pattern that we might see in our sample is also present in the population. The chi-square test is going to be used for that. Now on to the results section. The results section is going to be subdivided into descriptive results, and then much later on, the inferential results. The descriptive results are going to show us what pattern we might have in our data. Descriptive results are further subdivided into the numerical descriptive results and the graphical results. So the author is giving numerical descriptive results. Here's the two-way table of seat and class. Of course, the three groups into which the explanatory variable breaks, the back sitters, the front sitters, and the middle sitters, those three groups are not all the same size, and so we correct for differences in group sizes by looking at row percentages, and here they are. Notice that the author has carefully introduced every type of table that he or she produces. After producing the table, the author can begin to describe the relationship. So comparing some row percents down columns, the author is able to discover that front centers are more likely to be liberal arts majors. Next to the graphical results, again the author introduces the result that is about to follow. And here is the bar chart. Again, some discussion underneath, cueing the reader in to how the bar chart shows that, again, the front sitters are the ones who are most likely to be liberal arts majors. Next to the inferential results, the author gives a little introduction to the whole idea of an inferential question, and then begins to do the chi-square test, addressing all of the five major steps in the chain of reasoning for a test of significance. So the author doesn't say it, but step one involves stating the null and alternative hypothesis, and the author does that. States the null hypothesis that there is no relationship between seating preference and major preference in the UC Davis population. And then the author states an alternative hypothesis that says there is a relationship between these two variables. The next step in a chi-square test is the code that produces the output, and the output is shown here. The author's job is to describe and discuss all of the important parts of this output in relation to the research question. So notice that the author describes the chi-square statistic. It turns out to be 3.053. This is part of step three of a chi-square test, reporting your chi-square statistic. The author also uses this as a place to cue the reader into the significance of the degrees of freedom of the table. It's two. Remember, if the null hypothesis is correct, then you would expect the chi-square statistic to turn out to be about equal to the degrees of freedom. So, the plot thickens here. The null hypothesis expects the chi-square statistic to be around two. We've actually got 3.053. We're kind of wondering how unusual that is. Another part of step three in a chi-square test is to report the p-value. That's done right here. Also, it's very important to interpret the practical meaning of the p-value to the reader. The author does that in this next sentence. If the null is correct, if there's no relationship between seating preference and type of student out there in the UC Davis population, then there's about a 21.73% chance of getting a chi-square statistic at least as big as that 3.053 that 
that we actually got in the study. It's a good idea to talk to the reader about whether you can trust the approximation to the p-value that the machine gives you. Generally, those approximations are quite reliable when your sample size is big enough so that the expected cell counts are all at least five. Apparently, the author looked back at the counts expected by the null and found that indeed they were all at least five and explained to the reader that we could therefore trust this 0.2173 value. We didn't have to do something like simulation in order to get a more reliable approximation to the p-value. But the author appears to want to go a little further and maybe teach you how you might do such a simulation. So the author sets a seed, does the chi-square test on a two-way table that appears to contain information about seat and major, and out come the results. And indeed, the p-value obtained by simulation really isn't much different than the p-value that was obtained originally by the machine. This is extra proof that you can trust the p-value obtained by the machine. I don't think that that had to be done in this report. Most likely the author is just trying to give students a hint on how they might proceed if they have to do simulation. One thing you might want to note here is that this is a small set of results. That's because the author has chosen an option for both equal false. Because the previous call to chi-square test GC has already shown observed counts and expected counts and contributions. The author feels you don't need to see it again and set verbose as false. But if you were only going to do simulation, then you would not set verbose as false because you need the reader to see all of that other important output from the test. Step four in a test of significance is to make a decision about the null hypothesis. Remember that if the p-value is less than 0.05, you'll reject the null hypothesis, and if the p-value is larger than 0.05, you won't reject it. This time the p-value is about 21.73%, so much bigger than 0.05, we won't be rejecting the null. Step five, the very last step in the test of significance, is to state a simple and non-technical conclusion to the reader in one sentence. And this is done here. This data did not provide strong evidence that seating preference and major preference are related in the UC Davis population. So notice that the author actually went through all five steps in a, te in a chi-square test procedure, but didn't number out the steps or anything like that. He or she just made sure that all of those steps were part of the total argument. The final part is the discussion section in which you draw a general conclusion and wrap things up for the reader. Along the way, you may have noticed some things that are different about this report from what we saw back in chapter two. For example, sometimes the results appear without any code being shown. In the next video, we'll learn how that can be accomplished if you like. Also, in stating the hypotheses, the author appears to have been able to get some mathematical notation for the null hypothesis and for the alternative hypothesis, these italicized letters and subscripts. In the next video, you'll learn how to make them if you're interested in doing so. Also, it seems that the author can get italicized text and bullet items. We'll review how to do those things as well in the next video lecture. So stay tuned for the next video lecture. It will show how this particular data report was put together from an R Markdown document. Thank you for listening.